This week's episode of Cosmic Shenanigans is brought to you by the National University's online MFA program. Since 2005, they've helped working adults learn the craft of creative writing. There is no residency requirement, and genre fiction is welcome and accepted at this school. Horror, science fiction, fantasy, young adult, you can work with faculty like Lee Thomas and John Coyne. They focus in fiction, creative nonfiction, poetry, or screenwriting. And the screenwriting faculty are all active Hollywood professionals. Join an alumni network of over a 1,000 graduates. Get the idea in your head, out of your head, and onto the page. National University is an accredited, not-for-profit university. Explore more at www.nu.edu. Welcome, Welcome to, to Shenanigans in Sue with Mary San Giovanni! Welcome to Cosmic Shenanigans. I'm Mary San Giovanni, and as always, I'm up to shenanigans of cosmic proportions. Today, we will be discussing The Thing That Walked on the Wind by August Derleth. It was first published in 1933 in, I believe, the January Volume 3, Number 1 issue of Strange Tales. It's a little hard to get the exact details, but it appears to be that that's the first time it was ever published. It's a tale of first an entire town and then of the investigating officer going missing. And some of them turn up eventually dead or dying. And those dying to relate strange accounts of an ancient, incredibly large god of the air, known both as the Wind Walker and the Death Walker. This being is identified in later tales as Ithaca. Ithaca becomes uh, August Derleth's contribution to the Cthulhu mythos and to that pantheon of gods that the Cthulhu mythos is so famous for. In tales, it is said to be an inspiration for the Wendigo and Yeti sightings, but is essentially described as a giant, roughly human-shaped entity with webbed feet and glowing red eyes. Now, to be honest, I, I looked for an August Derleth tale for probably the last year. August Derleth is not easy to find online. Um, but the reason I wanted to do that is because he is, uh, he was a, a friend of Lovecraft's, a fervent supporter uh, of his work, and a contributor, as I mentioned, to the Cthulhu Mythos. The story, The Thing That Walked on the Wind, is, is one of his better known mythos tales. However, it's not terribly well written. To be honest, it's, it's not bad by any means. It's just not great. It relies perhaps a bit too heavily on stylistic tropes of Lovecraft's fiction. Uh, it take, and I think maybe if he had branched out a little bit more and I think really made his style his own instead of mimicking styles of people he, you know, he admired, I think in time it might have become, he might have become a, a very talented writer, but this story in and of itself is very Lovecraftian in pretty much every way. Uh, from the epistolary aspect that he takes a little bit too heavy-handed uh, uh, to creating a character, character who, despite law enforcement training and a generally stoic personality, seems both ineffective and stilted professionally and personally. Now, that being said, I do think that this story is an important contribution to cosmic horror canon in general because of its bridge-like quality. We've spoken of bridges before in cosmic horror stories, which to me are tales which bridge gaps between the weird fiction roots of cosmic horror and Lovecraft, or between Lovecraft and his cosmic horror contemporaries, or between those contemporaries and modern cosmic horror. Durless coining of the term Cthulhu mythos his efforts to keep Lovecraft in print, and his own stories, which contributed to and expanded on the Lovecraft mythos 
were certainly pivotal in the development of cosmic horror as a subgenre, and in particular, the latter, his own work, was definitely a bridge between, say, Algernon Blackwood's, Blackwood's personification of nature as an ancient and indifferent elder god, and Lovecraft's actual alien, ancient, indifferent elder gods. Uh, there's a quote in the story, uh, Africa, Blackwood has written of these things, and there are others, the old ones, elementals, and back to Lang, lost Lang, hidden Lang, whence sprung Windwalker, and others. This is a quote of one of the dying men when they're trying to figure out what happened to this town, what happened to these people who all just suddenly vanished. Uh, another quote, it seems that there still exists an age old belief that there are elemental spirits of fire, water, air, and earth, all powerful spirits subject to no one spirits actually worshiped in some parts of the world. Okay. These two quotes here, we, uh, we're looking at an entity, which is essentially an elemental. And this is why I say it's a, it's a bridge between Blackwood's personification of nature as a God and Lovecraft's actual indifferent elder gods. What we have here is a combination essentially of both, uh, that these elementals perhaps once came from Lang. Now Lang was a place created by Lovecraft, which has in, and we're going to discuss this a little bit later on. The location of Lang has been given both, uh, terrestrial and super terrestrial locations. So we're not, ex so it, it, it does sort of bridge that gap between, uh, creatures of this world and creatures of other worlds. Another quote, and I think that this sort of explains, uh, a good thing about, uh, Lang and the creatures from it. It seems that the inhabitants of Stillwater, Stillwater is the village in the story where everybody disappears from. It seems that the inhabitants of Stillwater to a body performed a curious worship, not of any God we know, but of something they call an air elemental. I'm going to come back to that. A large thing I am told vaguely like a man yet infinitely unlike him. Details are very distorted and unreliable. It is said to have been an air elemental, but there are weird hints of something of incredible age that rose out of hidden vastness in the far north from a frozen and impenetrable plateau up there. Of this I can venture nothing. Dr. Jameson mentions a plateau of Lang, and that's where we first get this, this mention of, of Lang in Durla's work. Now, Ithaca has appeared in other stories. This is not the first story he appears in, but it's the first story where there's a real development of what it might be, Ithaca. And the fact that it is both a god and an air elemental, which traditionally, if we look at uh, pagan belief systems throughout Europe, at least, um, and through, uh, I believe, Asia and parts of uh, Native American cultures that, that look at elementals. Elementals are often spirits that would be on the level of maybe angels or fairies or, you know, other kinds of uh, dryads, maybe like in ancient Greece, you know, nymphs, those kinds of things. Uh, they are occasionally elevated to the level of a minor god. So I think, and, and, and in Black, Blackwood's work, a lot of times, you get that sort of blurring of that boundary of how powerful this nature creature is. And again, a lot of these, a lot of these quotes, what they're showing here is Durlith taking pieces from things that he likes. He was an admirer of Blackwood. He was an admirer of Lovecraft. And I think that this story shows how well these kinds of things blend together in cosmic horror, how, how well the, the natural and the supernatural, how, how thin the boundary between those actually is and how thin the boundary between supernatural and preternatural is. So we get a lot of, uh, creatures and, and a lot of personification of nature where there's the suggestion of power, which is both of this earth and not of this earth. Now, speaking of things that are both of this earth and not of this earth, we have a note on Lang. Okay. Uh, for geographical purists, if you will. And this 
if I look at my notes, my citation of notes, I believe this is from the Wikipedia on Lovecraft. So I'm going to read you the quote, you know, in its entirety, because I think it gives it a sense of place as being as uh, blended in terms of, of, of power and location as the creature itself. Lovecraft's fictional character, Abdul Alhazred, allegedly describes it, Lang, as a place where different realities converge, which might explain why its precise location cannot be pinned down. According to this Wikipedia, uh, Lovecraft first mentioned and described aspects of Lang in Celepheus. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, Celepheus is a, a dream cycle story. Uh, it is a city. And the story was written in 1920. It's a city in the dream world, the dreamlands that Lovecraft mentions. Um, and it is described how this recurring character throughout the dream cycle, Karanis, quote, once barely escaped from the high priest, not to be described, which wears a yellow silken mask over its face and dwells alone in a prehistoric stone monastery on the cold desert plateau of Lang, end quote. Now, one of the interesting things about this particular quote, too, since we're going down this rabbit hole of interconnectedness within the mythos, is that this is a reference to Robert W. Chambers' The King in Yellow, because The King in Yellow is often described as having a yellow mask, uh, that he is both a priest and a god, and also a place. So there's a lot of that that uh, nebulousness, which I like in Cosmic Horror, because I feel what it does is that it breaks down the boundaries of our physical reality in assuming that something has to be, a, a place has to exist in only one location, or a being has to exist in only one form. And these these quotes, these stories, and this particular story, uh, I think they, they're, they're, it's a bridge between stories that do that and stories that don't. I think this is, it's a good example here. Now we go on to hear, uh, another, uh, description of Lang in Lovecraft's short story, The Hound from 1922, in which the dreaded Necronomicon places it in Central Asia and says it is inhabited by a human corpse-eating cult. Now, that idea of cannibals, a cannibal cult, does seem to follow Lang uh, in, in several descriptions of the place. But um, this, this is, I think, the only story that I'm aware of. I could be wrong. I think it's the only story that actually places Lang, though, in Central Asia, although there are references to... Um, Asian aspects of Lang, okay? Asian aspects of the culture, the architecture, things like that. Uh, most of the time, though, Lang is described as being in a very cold place, a very northernly cold place. In The Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath, which was written in 1926, the plateau of Lang is located in the north of the dreamlands. So this is, now we have Lang as, again, simultaneously existing both on Earth and in the dreamlands which is a separate alternate dimension accessible only in sleep. It's inhabited by the high priest not to be described, which again is a reference to Haster, who is also a reference to the king in yellow. Okay. Um, and this high priest not to be described dwells alone in a prehistoric monastery and by a race of degenerate goatish humans who are feared by all other men. Okay. At, in the, in, at the Mountains of Madness, there is an expedition from Miskatonic University which explores a plateau in Antarctica and discovers an ancient and apparently abandoned city built by the Elder Things. One member of the expedition, who has encountered references to the plateau of Lang in ancient texts, forms the hypothesis that the plateau they are exploring is in itself Lang. In common with the high priest's abode in the dream quest of unknown Kadath, the walls of the buildings atop the plateau are covered with detailed frescoes that are disturbing to read. However, it is never explicitly stated in the text or in any of Lovecraft's later works that this anarchic city actually is Lang. Although I think general, the general consensus by readers is that it is Lang. 
In fact, it seems more likely that the city is simply an outpost of the Elder Things, which came to Earth not to conquer, but to live in isolation. And that is sort of suggested in the story uh, in The Mountains of Madness that whoever founded this place just wanted to be left alone, as opposed to several other descriptions of the Plateau of Lang, which is inhabited by aggressive and hostile individuals. Now, the reason we spend so much time again is because I think that what Durlith is looking at in his stories, his contribution to the Cthulhu mythos is again, bridging some of these gaps, filling in some of these spaces and where things seem to contradict what his story does is to say, well, that's okay. Because one of the nature, natural aspects, I guess, one of the nature of cosmic horror is that you're redefining boundaries, physical boundaries. Uh, we've talked about this when we've talked about cosmic horror movies, how um, it's a lot more body horror than people generally give cosmic horror credit for because uh, a lot of times bodies are twisted out of shape into other horrific things. There is a metamorphosis going on. There's a change there. Uh, and a lot of times it's suggested in the context or the subtext of these works that the change has always been there. That if time is not linear and space is not linear, that the construct, the physical constructs of reality are not necessarily linear either. Okay. Now, when Lovecraft, while he often looked to underpin his supernatural beings with the scientifically possible or plausible in his dream work cycle, his dream cycle work, which I've always believed was one of the truly fantastical elements of the work that he allowed himself, um, it's still marginally tied into his Cthulhu mythos. Uh, there are several cross-references of places and beings who are capable of moving in and out of the dreamlands and the so-called real world. And Lovecraft often mentions communication from these beings to humans through dreams. Now, I believe that his dream cycle work was a nod to Clark Ashton Smith, whose work he admired. So again, there's another connection there of the fantastical. And as we've talked about, uh, a lot of Lovecraft's work was not supernatural in that sense. It was not, it, it, he, he was a, a staunch atheist. He did not believe in the supernatural. And as his work moved on, we, we've talked about this before, he tried to tie a lot of this to, to actual science, the difference between say a monster and an alien. Okay. Um, but the point is, is that Durlith, whether intentionally or unintentionally, he strengthens that overlap, that overlap of the dream cycle and the mythos, uh, the supernatural and the natural, however, uh, beyond our understanding or reason it might be by using Lang and drawing it again away from the north of the dreamlands and dropping it in the frozen north of earth again. Okay. Now, if we had a cosmic horror elements checklist on which we checked off boxes, we might be able to check off the cult box for cosmic horror. If we consider that the people of Stillwater, the village where everybody disappeared, offered human sacrifices to their ancient air elemental God. Uh, this evidently backfired on them as it so often does in cosmic horror, but there is a sort of, uh, reminiscence of, uh, the shadow over in his mouth where there's this idea that the, the people of an entire town are trading favors with gods. They're offering sacrifices in order to get something from the non-standard gods in return for these sacrifices. Uh, the quotes about the, about this particular cult, uh, are vague. They, he, it's, the people are never called cultists, but they do mention, quote, there are queer stories of some gigantic thing that these people summoned to their deeply hidden forest altars and still weirder tales of something seen against the sky in the glare of huge pine fires burning near still water by travelers on the Alassie Trail, end quote. So again, we have that idea of, of, of nature 
and magic sort of combined here. We have a blend of the ancient pagan nature magic systems and the possibly interdimensional or supernatural arrival of the gods. And as, as we've talked about, particularly in the episode where we talked about doorways and gateways and portals to other dimensions, there is a fairly consistent throughout ancient cultural religions and mythologies, a uh, fairly consistent concept that uh, that this is a, this is the origin of their gods. Several current ancient alien theories, if you're into that sort of thing, old and new pagan beliefs, and astrophysical speculations. Okay, science speak of intradimensional beings, not in not extraterrestrial beings, but intradimensional beings called ultra terrestrials, uh, which come encompass both things like elementals, fairy folk, and forest dwellers, as well as aliens and the alien abduction and UFO phenomena as being, and I thought this was kind of interesting, as being of the same type and origin. That there are very, very little difference between uh, alien abduction stories and changeling stories. Okay, that this idea that, uh, you know, you are sort of paralyzed and manipulated by these beings who, again, exist both in another dimension and here, either simultaneously or are capable of traveling back and forth. In essence, various species of entities from other dimensions are interacting in this world. Now, this could be a whole show in and of itself, so we'll table that for another episode. But the salient point here is Durleth's service as a bridge, again, to various weird fiction uh, prior to Lovecraft, which did use elements of nature personified as indifferent forces of, uh, uh, more powerful than we are, and cosmic horror devices which try to define and offer origins for the strange gods which dwarf and seek to decentralize us. Uh, that's pretty much it for this particular episode. Cosmic Shenanigans, however, is brought to you this week by The Lord of Always by David Bryan. Weird fiction collides with Gnostic tradition in The Lord of Always, a novel of supernatural mystery and cosmic terror. For Frank and Roz Tanner, booking a honeymoon at Penhale House set amid beautiful Cornish landscapes should have been the perfect getaway. But the house sits on a nexus point, a gateway to other realms. See, I'm already sold. As soon as there's a gateway to other realms, I'm in. Amid a turbulence of twisting realities and facing legions of fallen angels and nightmarish servitors, Frank and Roz become separated. Frank turns to a local pensioner for assistance, but the enigmatic George Schmoke is a man who offers more questions than answers. Confronted by dark gods and cosmic abominations, Frank learns of the great deceit being played on humankind. And as he faces a battle for his wife's soul, he knows he must succeed because saving Roz will be the key to everything. And there's a quote here from the story itself. I return my gaze to the fragmented monster resting in my palm. Can this really be the remains of an angel? And if it is, Shouldn't we all tremble in anticipation of what awaits at our end? The paperback, The Lord of Always by David Bryan, is available from various outlets. The ebook is exclusive on Amazon Kindle and can currently be read for free if you have a Kindle Unlimited subscription. If you enjoy Cosmic Shenanigans, you might also enjoy another show I co-host, The Horror Show with Brian Keene. Both of them are available on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and all of the platforms via the Project Entertainment Network. Also, thank you, as always, to Engineer Dave Thomas. You can watch his channel most nights at twitch.tv slash meteornotes, and you can check out new video games, old video games, upcoming video games, and all kinds of kitty cat shenanigans in between. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next week. Bye.
Hello, is anybody out there? Anybody? This is Jim Cobb. If you are hearing this, the worst has happened. I've recorded a podcast at the end of the world and will broadcast it on channel PEN every Friday. It's all about the apocalypse, books, movies, TV, how much food and water will you need your bunker, all that kind of stuff. Excuse me, sir. You're going to have to keep the noise down. You're in a library and you're scaring the kids. The world hasn't ended yet. Sorry, ma'am. Shh, you're in the library at the end of the world with host Jim Cobb. Fridays exclusively on Project Entertainment Network.